be in Daniel chapter 3 this evening. Last time we were together, we kind of walked up onto the front porch of Daniel 3, and we're going to finish the chapter this evening. So it'll be Daniel 3, uh, verses 8 to 30. We'll read it together. Uh, the word of the living God reads in Daniel chapter 3, verse 8 to, <coughs> to 30. Uh, you remember last time he set up this image in verse 7, as all the peoples uh, hear the sound of the music playing, uh, they fall down, they worship the golden image. Verse 8 in the, in the word of the living God reads that, Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews, they declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Well, they answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be torn limb from limb, 
and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Lord God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the time of worship that we've already had the privilege to be a part of. Thank you for these songs that we were able to sing. Thank you for stirring up the hearts of, of those who wrote these songs. Thank you for gifting your people with different gifts uh, to come together that your name would be worshipped by your church. Thank you for the ability to worship. Thank you for giving us a mind uh, that we may use to, to, to set our thoughts upon you. Lord, may, may our thoughts be set upon you more and more as we worship you during the time of the proclamation of your word. May you hallow your name further in our hearts. May, may your name be glorified. And may you be praised together as we amen in unison the greatness of what your word declares to us. Lord, may I not get in the way at all. May I just be a mouthpiece for your word. Lord, would you speak to us, your people, this evening? In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are back in the third chapter of Daniel. And in the context of where we are, you would remember that out of his idolatrous heart, out of Nebuchadnezzar's idolatrous heart, his great love for self and disdain for his creator, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had set up a great image that puts on display that very reality, that he loves himself and has a great disdain for his creator. Uh, God gave him a dream that was certain. He gave him a sure interpretation of that dream through Daniel, uh, but that didn't matter to Nebuchadnezzar. He was certainly in awe at the fact that Daniel's God could reveal such a thing. Uh, he, he revealed the dream. He gave the interpretation thereof. And he was definitely thankful for the information. But he wasn't thankful so that he could properly humble himself before divine truth. He wasn't thankful so that he could do that. He was thankful so that he could use that information in his quest to expand his own kingdom. He was thankful so that he could use that information in his quest to expand his own kingdom. So in response to his dream of a great statue representing different world kingdoms and God's revealed will that Nebuchadnezzar represents the golden head whose kingdom will in time pass away, Nebuchadnezzar sets up a whole 90 foot tall, 9 foot wide, uh, whole golden image, golden statue, uh, so that Daniel, his God, and everyone else would know who's really in charge here. Whose kingdom is really going to endure to the end? Who, who's really in charge? Who's really sovereign and in control here? If you remember, we read six times in the first seven verses of this chapter that Nebuchadnezzar set this image up. Uh, Aspen, you need to listen. Quit, quit messing with him. All right? seven, six times in the first seven verses of chapter three, we read, Nebuchadnezzar set it up. He set it up. He set it up. He set it up. There's a purpose for this. It's to bring about the emphasis of what is going on here, what he's doing here. Nebuchadnezzar is making very clear who his God is and who everyone else's God should be too. He's making very clear who his God is. It's himself, his kingdom, and who everyone else's God should be as well, which is one of the aspects of our idolatry. It doesn't just stay to ourselves. It very greatly affects how we treat one another. And you remember, he brings his boys out. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces. And then all the people of the kingdom from every nation were told by the herald that once they heard the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music that was played, they were to fall down and they were to worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And if they didn't, well, then they would be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. So you have two choices here. You have two choices. You're, you're going to fall in one of, of, of two places. You're going to fall in one of two places. You're either going to fall before the image or you're going to fall in a furnace. You're going to fall before the image or you're going to fall into the fire. And ending our passage last time, if you were to just end at verse 7, it would seem as though everyone worshipped the image. Because as soon as they heard the sound of all those instruments, we read that uh, all the people's nations and languages fell down 
and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Every people, tribe, language that was there fell down, worshipped the image. They worshipped Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar's idolatry overflowed from his authority into all of the land. And all of the kingdom of Babylon was full of idolaters as well. It didn't stop with Nebuchadnezzar. The whole kingdom was full of idolaters. People who did not worship their creator, the true God. And as I stated last time, as most of them are bowing down to this image, they're most likely bowing down to the false god of self-preservation. They're most likely bowing down because they want to continue to live. They'd rather fall down before the image than, than fall into that furnace. Because it would be hard for me to believe, at least, that all of these people were actually sold out for Nebuchadnezzar. That they were all, you know, for his glory and for his reign and for him. But it is easy to believe that they were worried about falling into that furnace. That they were worried about falling into that fire. They didn't want to lose their life. They didn't want to die. They didn't want to be known as those fools who just wouldn't bow down and save their life. Well, well of course you don't believe that Nebuchadnezzar is God, but you don't want to die, do you? Huh? Huh? Why don't you just bow down? You don't want to lose your life. All you got to do is bow down. All right? that, that doesn't mean you actually have to believe it. That doesn't mean you actually have to believe that Nebuchadnezzar is God. You don't have to. Good grief. Save your life. Just save your life. You can serve God later. You can't serve God if you're dead. Right? And again... What did we say that idolatry was last time? It's ultimately the love of self over God. It's the love of self over God. And that's exactly what they're doing. They are worshiping their self. They're, they're preserving of their life over God and what he says. It's exactly what you see from all those who bowed down at the image of Nebuchadnezzar. It's exactly what we see in our world today. As the majority of the world bows down to the standards set forth by contemporary culture. And not the standards set forth by our creator in his word. And though we may not go through uh, the exact same circumstances here as shown in this country today, uh, there's definitely much application from our passage this evening as we see in fact that everyone didn't fall down, right? There were some who didn't fall down when all those instruments played. There were actually three young men who didn't fall down. They chose to remain standing as in their hearts they bowed down to the God of heaven and earth. In their hearts, they were bowed down to God, and so they stood in the midst of the idolatry of Babylon. Because of that, they faced the wrath of the contemporary culture in their life for not doing so. And praise God that they did. Praise God that those three men were faithful in the midst of all peoples and tribes and nations who were, who were not. Praise God that they did, because we get to see a great picture of the sustaining grace of God in this passage, and we see put on display the truth of Jesus' words that whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for his sake will find it. And we'll make our way through this chapter under three headings, the first being the child of God's response to the idolatry of Babylon. The child of God's response to the idolatry of Babylon. And this is immediately brought to our attention by the Chaldeans who came forward to King Nebuchadnezzar and maliciously accused the Jews, maliciously accused these, these three young men. They remind Nebuchadnezzar of his decree and move forward to bring to his mind that there are certain Jews whom he had appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon who are paying no attention to his decree whatsoever. Uh, so these are not just regular, everyday, working Babylonians that, that are not following his decree. These are ones that Nebuchadnezzar himself has set over the affairs of Babylon. If you remember, that happened by the request of Daniel at the end of chapter 2. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we read their names several times as we read through that passage. And they are not serving his gods, nor are they worshiping the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. These three young men were children of God. right? They, they were children of God. And what children of God do, what they do, is they serve the Lord in accordance with what he has revealed in his word. That's what children of God do. They serve the Lord in accordance with, with what he has revealed in his word. They don't, they don't follow wicked decrees of men. Just because someone tells them to bow down at an image, they don't do that. They don't follow wicked decrees of men. They don't follow opinion. They don't follow human reason. 
Uh, they don't follow the, the philosophies of their day. Uh, they don't follow what may or may not feel right at the time. They just follow what God's word says. They just say, hey, God's revealed this truth and, and I'm going to follow what God says. I'm, I, it's always going to go well for me if I just follow what my creator says. He's infinite. He knows all. So he's, he's given me this objective standard of revelation. And so I'm just going to put my trust in that and not what a finite man says. Right? So God says in Exodus 20, verse 1 to 6, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay? He says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And as God's steadfast love is upon them, his covenant keeping, electing love that is upon them, they understand that God has said, thou shalt not. God said, thou shalt not. And so they shall not. Amen. Amen. God said, thou shalt not. So they shall not. They made the decision to not bow down regardless of the circumstance. I'd rather take the furnace than have a God before my God. I serve the true God. I'm a child of his. He said, don't, you don't do that. You don't bow down to idols. So I'm going to bow down to the God of heaven and earth in my heart and stand up in the midst of the idolatry of Babylon. And that should be our response to the idolatry of the Babylon we live in today as well. To not be taken captive by philosophy, to not be taken captive by empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of this world, but to be taken captive by Christ and to be taken captive by his truth. But these Chaldeans here, in contrast, they bought, they bought into this. They bought into the spirit of the age. They bought into the elemental spirits of the world. These Chaldeans have been taken captive and they were upset that these three Jews were unwilling to conform to the standards of the culture at their time. They're upset about this. They don't, they don't like seeing this. Uh, just as Cain and Abel... The righteousness of the Jews here, of these three Hebrew young men, have reminded them of their evil in following the course of this world, and they didn't like it. They had to point it out. Hey, you know, we're all doing this. This is, this is what everyone has decided is best and what needs to be done, but they're not doing it. These three guys, they're not doing it. This, we've all agreed on this. This is working well for us. We're, we're, we're all not dying. Life is going well. They're not doing it. They're not serving our God of self-preservation. They're standing out of the crowd and really making us look bad. Right? They're not putting the mask on. They're not doing it. We're all doing it. What's, what's going on here? Um, we, we need to go tell the king. That's what we need to do. We need to go tell the king on these uh, troublemakers. Rather than honoring these men for their faithfulness to the Most High God, they slander them. They slander them as those who pay no attention to the king whatsoever. When I, I assure you, as, as children of God, they would have been the most faithful in overseeing the affairs of Babylon. They would have been the most faithful and, and respectful and reverent to the king and his orders when they were lawful. They, they would have been the most faithful as the children of God. But the Chaldeans know what they're doing. They want to bring forward the king's wrath. They want the world to be rid of these followers of Almighty God so that they won't have to be reminded of their evil anymore. They don't want to be reminded of their sin anymore. They want everything to go well for them. They want to be comforted in their sin. So they want to get rid of them. And you know, there's a great underlying principle here that Sinclair Ferguson brings up in his commentary on Daniel. And that's that the people of God do not have a psychological need to make a big deal out of their acts of obedience to the Lord. They don't have a, a psychological need to make a big deal to blow the horn every time they act in obedience to the Lord. We do not need to constantly draw attention to the world, the fact that we are different from them. That's going to show as we are simply being obedient to our Lord. We don't have to hold up a sign. Uh, now, there may be times when we do need to hold up a sign, but we don't have to because when you're living in a world that's full of people who are all bowing down to the idol, it's going to be noticeable when you're not. It's going to be noticeable when you're standing up and not going in the same flow that they're going. 
When you're walking down the narrow road and they're all walking down the wide path, you're going to bump shoulders. They're, they're going to see you. It's going to be noticeable uh, in a land that is consumed with idolatry, consumed with love for self and not love for God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't have to point out to the people that they weren't doing it because the majority of the culture uh, just saw it. It, it, was, it was noticeable to them. It's going to be obvious uh, when everyone else is bound down and you're not. And we see that in the Chaldeans being the one bringing up what they're doing, right? The Chaldeans went and told king. Uh, they, they didn't go out and, and blow the horn and tell everyone, hey, look at me, you bow downers. You're all bowing down and, and we're not. No, they, they didn't have to do that because they went and told the king. They, they, don't, they don't want the righteousness in their land. They want, they want to rid their land of righteousness. And don't be surprised when that happens to you. Don't be surprised when that happens to you as you seek to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. That's going to happen. It's going to happen. Uh, your God, yourself, and everyone else around you may know the truth of who you are and what you're doing, but that, not, that may not be what the world is portraying about you. It may not be what they're going to tell everybody about you. They may say something else that is in total contrast to who you are. Why? Because they want the world to be rid of you. They don't, they don't love your righteousness. They, they want you to, to, to be out of here. Your God, yourself, and everyone else around you to know the truth. You, uh, you may be portrayed by the world as someone who disregards others. You may be portrayed by the world as someone who disregards authority in your life. You may be re re regarded and portrayed as a troublemaker here, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But regardless of the slander of the world, regardless of what comes of it, you, your God, the God of gods, the God of justice, knows the truth. He knows the truth. He's going to right every wrong. Regardless of what they do, you have the God of, of all gods on your side. And he's the God of justice and the God who says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Beloved, serve the Lord and trust your soul to a faithful creator while doing good, whatever may come. And here in this situation, the crybaby Chaldeans get their way. Nebuchadnezzar, in a, in a furious rage, commands that the three children of God be brought before him. And, and he seems somewhat befuddled at their disobedience in his response. In, in verse 14, he says, I, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Is this true? He seems almost befuddled in his response, like he can't understand what's going on here. Like, what in the world's going on? You know, I, I thought we were boys. I set you over the affairs of Babylon. I thought everything was going well. You're not serving my gods. You're, you're not bowing down to my, uh, to my image that I've set up. You're, you're not going to worship it? Now, now look, verse 15. I mean, look, if you're ready to do it now, well and good. Guys, I, I'm going to give you another chance. If you're ready to do it now, hey... It's, it's going to be all right. It's going to be well and good with you. Okay. When you hear the sound of the horn and the pipe and the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, if you're ready to fall down, okay, th things, are going to be, things are going to be good. It'll be, it'll be just fine. But if you don't fall down, you're falling into a fiery furnace. If you don't fall down before this image, if you don't burn your pinch to Caesar, if you don't give me this, you're going to fall down into a furnace. I'm, I'm going to... Uh, show the world what happens. I'm going to show all these people what happens when you don't do what I'm telling you to do. I'm going to make an example out of you. And you guys really need to think about this. Now, look, what he, look at what he says there at the end of verse 15. The arrogance. Uh, who is the God who, who will deliver you out of my hands? You, you really need to think about this. Because when I throw you into this furnace, who is the God that's going to deliver you out of my hands? I'm in control. I'm the master of the ship. You know, the arrogance of such a statement. It immediately made me think of Pharaoh in Exodus 5. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? Who is, who is he? Who is this guy? The Lord? Look, nobody's stopping me. Nobody's going to deliver you out of my hands. What God is going to do this? None. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were resolved to follow their Lord in worshipful obedience regardless of the results, trusting him. And trusting their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. 
And just as we saw in chapter 1, that resolve that was not only in Daniel's heart, but theirs as well, was still there and would have most definitely continued to grow with God's grace. That resolve in, in Daniel 1 has grown as they have continued to be faithful through all these circumstances and situations that God has placed into their life that they've been faithful to serve him through. So just as Jesus exhorted those around him in Luke 12, these men did not fear those who can kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do, but they feared him who, after he is killed, has the authority to cast into hell. That's who they feared. They feared the Lord. They didn't fear man, because man can just kill you, and, and that's it. They can't touch you anymore after they've hurt you physically. God can do a lot more than man can do. Now, they very well may have felt some fear here. I, I can only imagine what you would have felt knowing that you're about to be thrown into a fiery furnace. They, they very well may have felt some fear here. I mean, if they burn in this furnace, that's going to hurt pretty bad. It, it's not going to feel good at all. No doubt about that. But the fear of the Lord that they had, their fear of the Lord, greatly superseded, greatly outweighed their fear of man. They worshiped God, not an idol. They worshiped God, not their self, not their feelings. They worshiped God. So notice their response, verse 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, even if he doesn't, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Okay, so our God is able, he will, and even if he doesn't, we're not serving you. All right? He's able, he will, but even if he doesn't, we're not serving you. Even if he doesn't, he's worthy of our service unto death. Even if he doesn't, he is worthy and you are not, Nebuchadnezzar. He's worthy. He's the greatest treasure I have in my life. He is worthy unto death, even if he doesn't. He's able, he will, and even if he doesn't, I'm serving him. Our God is the God who upholds the universe by the word of his power. In his hand is the life and breath of all living things. He upholds Nebuchadnezzar's life. He controls this very fiery furnace. He could put that fire out like that. With a snap of a finger, he could put the fire out if he wanted to. Do. He's omnipotent. As Paul says in Ephesians 3.20, he is able to do far more abundantly, exceedingly abundantly than all that we could ask or think. That's the God we serve. That's the God who upholds the whole universe and everything within it by the word of his power. Everything's been created for his glory. He's able to do far more than I can even think, than, than, than whatever could even come into my mind. He can do far more, exceedingly abundantly more than that. That's the God we serve, the true God. We don't serve a God who is the work of human hands. We don't serve a God who I can think of in my imagination. Psalm 115, 5 to 7. They have mouths, but they don't speak. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. Noses, but they don't smell. They have hands, but they do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. And they don't even make a sound in their throat. No. We serve the God who created this world ex nihilo, out of nothing, who sustains his creation and is able to do all things within his creation that please him. The God who works all things together for good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, whose covenant-keeping love stays upon those who follow him, and there is no fire on earth that can separate his people from him. Beloved, he controls the fire. He controls the fire. He is able. He will. And even if he doesn't, we ain't serving your false gods. We're not doing it. He's, he's worthy of our service. Even if, even if he doesn't, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's really a win-win here. He will, he is able, he will, and even if he doesn't, we're not serving your false gods. We're not bowing down to the standard that the culture has agreed upon. It doesn't matter what you've agreed upon. It matters what God has said. Uh, we're not committing spiritual fornication with the adulterous Babylon. Sometimes you hear that question pop up. You, Think about putting yourself in, in the situation of these three young men. Sometimes you hear that question pop up that if someone came to your house, put a gun to your head, was going to kill you if you didn't recant Christ, what would you do? Right? If someone comes, you got a, you got a gun to your head, you better recant your faith in Christ or I'm going to kill you. What, what would you do? Well, you could pose the same thing in this situation. If you were Shadrach, Meshach, or Abednego, would you have fallen down and worshipped to save your life? 
Or would you have been resolved to stand and profess the truth even if it meant going down to the fiery furnace? What would you have done? Would you have fallen down to the image and saved your life? Or would you have went down to the furnace to the glory of God? What, what, you know, what would you have done? And I believe the answer to that question is not in imagining what you would do in some imaginary instance where that would happen. Or not imagining what you would do in the future. The answer is examining what are you doing now? How are, are you serving him now? What are you doing now? I think the answer to that question of what you would do then is what you're doing now. You can speculate all day long whether you would die for your Lord in the future. Are you dying for him now? Are you dying for him now? Uh, because if we're not taking up our cross daily, Luke 9, 23, if we're not dying daily for our Lord, then I'll go ahead and tell you what you do in this situation. If, if you weren't dying for him five minutes beforehand, you wouldn't die for him then. If you, wouldn't, if you haven't been dying for him months and years, if you haven't been following him, dying daily, taking up your cross, why would, why would I expect you to die for him then? I wouldn't. You'd be on your knees bowing down, just as you've been doing in your everyday life. Bowing down to the world, bowing down to the culture, bowing down to self-preservation and fear of man, and not fear of God. Faithfulness and resolve in these situations is shown by those who are faithfully resolved in the normal, everyday affair matters of life, losing their life for his sake. But in doing so, they're constantly experiencing and learning what true life really is, dying for the sake of Christ every day. But Nebuchadnezzar is not having any of it. Nebuchadnezzar is not having any of it. And here in verses 19 to 23... We'll put this under the heading of the, of the wrath of Babylon. The wrath of Babylon. The faithfulness to God of these three men bring about the unrighteous wrath of Babylon, which is something similar to a little kid's temper tantrum. It's nothing compared to the righteous wrath of Almighty God. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, we read, was filled with fury. His face was changed against them, and he ordered the furnace to be heated up seven times more than it usually was. And he ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be bound up and to be thrown inside. And it was so hot, it was so hot that we read that the flame of the fire killed the men who were ordered to throw them in the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar and the rest of Babylon are so consumed with getting the truth extinguished, so consumed with getting these, these three young faithful men to God out of here, that they will do so even if, even if it means their own people dying in the process. They're, they're not worried about human life. They're just worried about their agenda. They're worried about their false agenda, their kingdom expanding, and not God's kingdom. That's what they're worried about. They don't care about human life. They care about their wicked agenda, whatever it takes. The lives of others will, were well worth the task of keeping the agenda set forth and moving. Babylon will endure, and there will be no opposition. And with the mess that is propagated today by liberal thinkers and Black Lives Matter and so forth today, we see that there's actually nothing new under the sun at all. These three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're now fallen, bound into the burning, fiery furnace. And just the same, as Peter would tell us, we must not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon us to test us, as though something strange were happening. Amen. We are to rejoice, he says. We are to rejoice insofar as we share the sufferings of Christ. We shouldn't be surprised when this happens. Like it's, you know, something out of the blue. I, I wasn't expecting that. We shouldn't be surprised because we are to share in the sufferings of our Lord. Just as we've seen from the hostility of the Chaldeans and bringing the men forward to Nebuchadnezzar and, and slandering them and even now and being thrown into the furnace, Beloved, as long as we're not bowing down and we're standing up for truth, we should expect something from a world who hates it. We should expect something from a world who hates truth and, and is bowing down to falsehood while we're standing up for truth. And even more, if they treated our Lord in like manner, how much more would they treat us? A servant is no greater than his master. A servant is not better than his master. It's going to happen. They treated our Lord like this. They put him on a cross to try to get rid of him, to try to get the truth out so they could continue their false, wicked agenda. In Acts 14, after being stoned so bad that they left the Apostle Paul for dead, he gets back up, he goes back into the towns where the people were from, who stoned him, and Antioch, and uh, Iconium, and Lystra. He goes back to the towns, and he did so 
in order to strengthen the souls of the disciples and encourage them in the faith. And what he said to them was this. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. He, he got stoned so bad, they left him for dead. He goes back into the, the, to the towns, to the cities, where the people were from that stoned him. And he, he goes back to the brothers, he goes back to the church, and he says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Guys, this is going to happen. Okay? Don't be surprised when the fire trial comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. If we're going to enter the kingdom of God, it's going to be, it must be, through many tribulations. That's what he says. That's what the apostle teaches. Beloved, if we're a part of God's kingdom, we shouldn't be surprised at the fire. Honestly, we should be surprised if the fire never comes. That's what we should be surprised at. We shouldn't be surprised at the fire. We should be surprised if the fire never comes. Now, that's not me saying that we need to go pick an argument after the service. That's not me saying to go over to Dollar General and pick an argument with someone so that you can have some fire on you, so you can have some persecution on you. That's not persecution. That's you picking an argument and getting into it with somebody. I've heard people speak about this before, and it felt like they were saying that if I don't actively always have someone come after me, then I need to test myself whether I be in the faith, because I should just always be going through some persecution or something like that. I'm not saying that. But Jesus did say, beloved, he did say in John 15, if we were of the world, then the world would love us as his own. As its own. That if we were of the world, then the world would love us as its own. And if Babylon has no problems whatsoever with us, if they're just at home with everything that we're bringing about and everything that we're teaching, then probably the reason is with us and our lack of devotion to the Lord and our devotion to our self-preservation and being nice and not truly loving and telling the truth. Babylon's just at home with whatever we're doing. And, and we do need to examine ourselves in. We do need to examine ourselves in. But I can assure you, regardless of what you or I go through for the sake of the gospel, it's nothing compared to what our Lord went through for the sake of the gospel. And if we have the spirit of the conquering Christ living within us, then we can and we will endure through anything and everything that this world tries to throw at us. Regardless of the fire that we go through, beloved, he who calls you is faithful he will surely do it. Amen? He will surely do it. He will surely keep you and preserve you unto the end. And that's where we finish our passage. With the sustaining grace of God put on display. There in the fire, and King Nebuchadnezzar all of a sudden rises up with haste. He rises up very quickly. And he's astonished at what he's seen. Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? Oh, they answer, true, O king. Well, you're exactly right. That's, that's true. It was just three. It was. Nebuchadnezzar answers, verse 25, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire. They're, they're not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. So not only are they unbound, but they're just walking around in the fire, checking the furnace out. They're, they're hanging out. They got a friend with them. They got a guest over. They're just hanging out in the furnace. The power of God has them perfectly fine in the fire. The power of God has them perfectly fine in the midst of the fire. In the midst of the furnace, they're, they're fine. They got a guest over. They're just hanging out in the fire. They're not in the fire grumbling because they wish they were doing something else a little bit more comfortable. They're perfectly fine in the fire because that's where their God would have them. That, that's where their God wanted them to be. He's sovereign. He works all things according to the counsel of His will. God, he's in control. They're fine in the fire because that's where their God would have them. And I understand this is a physical fire. And God is able to do this. Amen. God is able to do this. But beloved, don't think that this doesn't have application for the fires of life that we get thrown into. As Peter calls them, those fiery trials that come upon us to test us. Right? We get so spoiled living in this country that we naturally get trained to hate the fire. We want nothing to do with the fire. We want nothing to do with the bad circumstances. As soon as they come, what can I do to get out of them? We're just immediately praying, not God change my heart so that I can learn something in this fire, so that I can come to know you more in this fire. I'm immediately praying, fire go away. That, that's, that's the whole point of my prayers. It's, it's just, we just get cultivated to live this way in this country. Now, that's not what our God tells us to do. We're called to rejoice, 1 Peter 4.13. In so far as we share the sufferings of Christ, that we may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed at His coming. 
We're called to rejoice. We're called to be thankful in all circumstances. I'm not necessarily for all circumstances. I'm not going to say we're going to be thankful for every evil action that happens. But we can be thankful in them all. And we can be thankful for them all. Knowing that it is our loving Father who has made everything for its purpose. And given them all to us to continue his perfect work that he has begun in our lives. So regard, I mean, we, I'm not going to say I'm thankful for every matter of evil that comes against us, but we can be thankful for them in as much as we see that God is using them and giving them to us to shape us into who he would have us be. To bring us to know more and more of Christ Jesus. To share in his sufferings. To test us. To show how much more we need to depend upon him. Which is immensely more beneficial for our soul than no fire at all. In them, God is showing how great his salvation is, as we are still able to be in peace in the midst of them, knowing that he's working all things together for our good, knowing that he's glorifying his name in us, and knowing that what we're going through isn't purposeless. It's, it has meaning. He's ordained it in our life for a purpose to conform us more into the image of the Son, which is a greater purpose and plan that we could ever think of. That's the sustaining grace of God in the midst of the fire. That we can walk in the midst of it by His power. We can be in the valley of the shadow of death and have no fear because He's with us. And we're not alone. He'll never leave nor forsake us. He's with us until the end of the age. He's with us with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit now. He's always with us. We can, we can be content whether we be starving or full, whether we be comfortable or not. Whether we be in the fire or not in the fire. Because we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. And there's been much debate and spilled ink over who this fourth person is in the fire. And honestly, it doesn't change anything whether this is an angel, as Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 28. Or if this is a pre-incarnate Christ here. I, I mean, I would probably lean that way. But it doesn't change uh, anything either way. Now, I have been told before that this is one of the reasons why the King James Bible is better than others. Because it has Nebuchadnezzar here saying that the fourth person looks like the Son of God. That's what the King James says. The fourth one looks like the Son of God. So, of course, they would say this is the pre-incarnate Christ. And all the major contemporary word-for-word -word translations, ESV, uh, NASB, have that Nebuchadnezzar says that the fourth person looks like a son of the gods. One of their Babylonian false gods. So, don't you see that these new translations are from the devil? Right? Right? King James says it's the Son of God. Those others, they say the Son of the gods. We ain't having that. Well, context is key. Going back to, you know, the Aramaic is key. Um, because as I said, Nebuchadnezzar also says that it was an angel just a few verses later. He does say that it was an angel. And the same word in Aramaic that is used for the true God is also used for the pagan Babylonian gods as well. You know, it's not a different word. It's the same word. You just know in the context who they're talking about. And I would say so far in the context of Nebuchadnezzar's understanding that he most likely is speaking of a son of his pagan gods or something like that. I don't think he actually said he looks like the son of God. I don't imagine Nebuchadnezzar knowing exactly what the pre-incarnate Christ would look like to be able to say, you know, that fourth one really looks like the son of God. He really does because I know what he looks like. Uh, so I don't, I don't see that happening. But all that aside... That doesn't mean that this couldn't be the pre-incarnate Christ. As I said, I, I, I would lean that way, most likely. But nevertheless, it doesn't change anything because this whole situation is putting on display the power of God to sustain his people through anything. Whether it's an angel that's there to serve his people or whether it is the pre-incarnate Christ, it's there to show us the power of God to sustain his people through anything, regardless of the means that he chooses to do so by. So Nebuchadnezzar calls him out. And they come out no problem. And Nebuchadnezzar's boys, the satraps, prefects, governors, kings, counselors, they gather around them. They check them out to see what the fire might have done to them. And they find out that not one hair of their head was singed, nor were their cloaks harmed. And there was not even a smell of smoke on them. There was, there was nothing. They came out completely clean. The only thing that burned off was what they bound them with. They were clean. The fire didn't do anything to them. And if Nebuchadnezzar was amazed before at the ability of the God of heaven to tell him his dream and interpret it through Daniel, now he is even more. Right, verse 28, he says, Blessed 
be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside, who, uh, that word can also mean who changed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. And then concluding the passage, he makes a decree that anyone who speaks anything against this god will be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. He must have had a thing for that because he, you remember that's what he wanted to do for uh, the wise men who couldn't tell him the dreams. So he's just itching to do that. Um, but they're going to be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins because there is no other god who is able to deliver this way. And then he promoted the three young men in the province of Babylon. Next week, we will begin to look at what I believe is the actual conversion of Nebuchadnezzar. I, I believe he is converted and I'll give you the reasons for that next week. Next week, we'll begin to look at that. But here, I believe that this is just further selfish amazement at the true God. He's just selfish, selfishly, wow, look at this. There, I, now, first I found out this God can tell me what I'm dreaming and give me the interpretation. Now i got a God who can save people out of fires. I mean, how could I expand this kingdom of Babylon now using this God? He's, he's amazed. Um, and God definitely used this for his servants to be exalted and his name to be praised in Babylon. But right now, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he's just amazed. Not, not only can God tell me my dreams, and now I have a God who can, who can save people from the fire. But again, in this, we see God's sustaining grace to bring his people through anything, even a real fire, if he so chooses, which is important for us to see even over 2,500 plus years from this happening, because we shouldn't be worried ourselves about the fiery furnace of the world that they might throw us in as well. We serve the God who is able, the God who will, and the God who even if he doesn't deliver us from the world's fiery furnace, all the world can literally do is take our physical life and nothing else. That's all they can do. We, we serve the God who is able, who will, and even if he doesn't, man can't do anything to us anyways. He's worthy of our service unto death. And then... As I said earlier, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord because nothing can separate his people from him. Right? We have a great Savior who has went before us and conquered the world for our sake, who, who went to the cross and by a single offering has perfected uh, for all time those who are being sanctified, his people, dying for our sins, providing the righteousness that we need to be justified in God's sight, perfected for all time, not because of who we were, but because of who our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, has been for us. So we must continue to serve him, knowing that regardless of what the world tries to do to us, regardless of what kind of fire we're thrown in, when it's all said and done, we're coming out and we're coming out just like those three Hebrews came out without a smell of smoke on us, without a trace of Babylon on us. That's how we're coming out. No presence of sin whatsoever, shining like the sun in the consummated kingdom of our father. That's how we're coming out. Revelation 7, 13, who are these clothed in white robes? From where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of great tribulation. These are the ones. These are the ones coming out. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, because of, because they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb, they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Literally, he'll, he'll pitch his tabernacle over them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. When it's all said and done in Christ... That's what you're coming out to. Perfectly clean. Not, not a, a presence of sin whatsoever. Not a presence of Babylon, uh, of smoke whatsoever. You're coming out of this world, coming out of the fire, completely clean. Praise God indeed. But if you're not in Christ this evening, if you're not in Christ this evening, I want you to know that you're not coming out. You're going in. You're not coming out. You're going in. Because there's a greater fiery furnace coming. And it's coming for all those who are in rebellion to our great God and our great creator. In the parable of the wheat and tares, or the wheat and the weeds, depending on your translation, 
Jesus says in Matthew 13, verse 40 to 43, Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers, and will throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's where all those who, who are in rebellion against God and who reject the Lord Jesus Christ will go, will be thrown. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 43 says, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. That's the fiery furnace that truly means something. That's, that's the fiery furnace that really matters. Forget what the world has to say. Do we know Christ? Do we know Christ? Are we reconciled to God through the person and the works of Christ? Do we abide in His Word? Do we follow Him? Do we love Him? Is He the greatest treasure in my life? A a am I clinging to Christ? Am I reconciled to God in Christ? Because if not, it doesn't matter whether you have the whole world on your side. It doesn't matter if you know, you're part of the Chaldeans and, and you know, all the peoples and nations and tribes are bowing down and they're on your side. It, it doesn't matter. If you are not reconciled to God in Christ, you will be tormented by the holy and righteous wrath of God for an eternity because you worship self, you worship creation over your creator, you feared man over God and his greatness and his eternal beauty. Do not fear a fire that lasts for but a time. Fear a fire that if you continue to trust in yourself and rebel against God will last for an eternity. See the greatness of Almighty God your creator. See the greatness of the salvation He has provided in the person of the Son. See the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow Him. May the grace of God in Christ be exalted in our hearts this evening. May He continue to work in us that which is pleasing in His sight to the glory of His name, regardless of what He ordains for us to go through. May God bless the preaching of His Word. And may He who has ears, may God give you ears to hear. May he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Would you bow with me? Lord God, thank you for this word. Thank you for the truth that you will never leave us nor forsake us. God, it's such a privilege to know that a sinner like me, a rebel like me, who deserves nothing but your wrath, who deserves nothing but death, through Christ, has been brought out of darkness into your marvelous light. To be an ambassador of Christ. What a privilege. What, what glory is in that. What grace is in that. Amazing grace it is, Lord God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy in Christ. Thank you for the fact that regardless of what I go through, that in Christ, as your child, I'm coming out. Because of your power, I will endure. The Lord Jesus says, he who endures to the end will be saved. And all those who are in Christ will endure to the end. You who began a good work in us will complete it. You're in control. From you, through you, to you, are all things. To your name will be the glory forever. And just as the hymn says, Lord God, we, we just must trust and obey. Follow you serve you in the midst of anything, knowing that you are the God who is able to do far more abundantly, exceedingly abundantly more than we could even ask or think. Why wouldn't we trust you in the midst of anything? Regardless of what the world throws at us, regardless of what happens, you are the God who is able, the God who will, and even if you don't, Man can't do anything but take our body. And even if you don't, you are worthy of our service. You are worthy. You are worthy of God. And even if they do take our body, to be absent from the body is to be in your presence. And to be in your presence is to be in the fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Lord God, would you hallow your name further in our hearts this evening? Lord God, uh, I pray that the ones that are, uh, were not able to make it this evening... I, Lord God, I, I just I pray that by the power of your spirit that you would uh, stir them up in righteousness. I pray that they would know that they are missed and loved by us. Um, Lord God, I pray that you would bring to their minds just 
the great truth of your word, that they would feel comfort at this very moment, that they would feel peace uh, in their soul, peace that passes all understanding because of who you are for them. I pray that you, by your providence, would guide them back, that we would worship together uh, with one voice in spirit and truth. Lord, by your providential hand, would you guide us back to our places of dwelling, uh, that we may indeed do that, that we may indeed uh, come back together. I was going to say on this Lord's Day, but come back together tomorrow uh, to watch the movie. I pray that you bless that time. Uh, and then Saturday, uh, during the Reformation Day, uh, as, as we go to the well and we sing your praises and, and proclaim your truth. Lord God, I pray that you would bless that time and prepare the hearts for whoever would come and for whoever would be passing by. Lord God, would you, would you glorify your name in this community to the praise of your glorious grace. In Jesus' name, amen.